Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know there's a, a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot on TV nowadays, so to come out and actually listen to us is, is a good thing. But I'm very proud of the organization that has been created, uh, Neighborhood Crime Watch. It's quite amazing. And to know that you, we in Yarmouth have the most Crime Watch neighborhoods of anyone that we know, any other community. It's amazing. So it's all because of you. It's not because of me. You care for your town. You've got a great organization that's leading you that has uh, grown on its own, led by Lieutenant Cotty, who is our liaison, and it's quite impressive to watch what is, what is taking place. You know, it's almost to the point I get afraid to the fact that you're going to outgrow the police department, <laughs> and I'm going to be out of a job. So, um, which that might not be a bad thing either. Um, but anyway, um, I'm glad to be here tonight, but I would like to first have a moment of silence for Officer Greg Maloney, the Plymouth Police Department, who died last week. Okay, thank you. Um, little housekeeping notes. I would like George Mulgornroth to come up here tonight. He's not expecting this. I know where you are. I know where you all are and have been. So, George, uh, tonight I am presenting him with his certificate. George completed the 21st Citizen Police Academy of the Yarmouth Police tonight Department. And right now, as I speak, the graduation is taking place at the Irish Village down the street. So I was already there. I am here doing this. And I will be back there as soon as I'm done with this. But anyway, <laughs> congratulations, Thank you. George. Thank you, sir. Can I just give the CTA a plug? Sure. Folks, uh, I went to this not knowing what to expect, and it was wonderful. If you have been to it, you probably reinforce what I have to say. If you haven't, you owe it to yourself to do it. This is a first-class operation. If you have pride in the police force without having been to the academy, that pride will multiply once you see the quality of the staff that are doing our policing. So thanks for the right. opportunity. Thank you. I'll give you a little update of what's, what's going on around town um, with the police department. First thing I'd like to mention is Officer Nicholas Pascarosa. He's our school resource officer at Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School. Ironically, um, about three weeks ago, we, we gave him a meritorious service award from the police department and we, uh, for his unbelievable uh, service that he does at the high school. He's been doing it for almost 20 years, and he has uh, done amazing things. He's a leader across the Cape and across the state. This week, he was at the Mass Juvenile Officers Association seminar for the past three days. And unbeknownst to us and him, he was given a meritorious service award for them, which is the highest award they give. So we're quite proud of his uh, um, award. And uh, he is also, he runs the Citizens Police Academy, so any, a lot of you know him. And uh, he's a true professional, one of the many that we're proud to have. We had town meeting last night. I know a bunch of you were here. I'm proud, to, uh, happy to see that uh, some of you were there in support of our government. It's a very interesting process, as uh, if you saw it on TV. Uh, it brings out all types, and uh, but <laughs> it's the beauty of our government. It really is. Uh, everybody has a voice, regardless of who you are, you know, what religion you are, what race you are. It's really quite interesting and. Um, it's not unlike going to Crime Watch. When you listen to people, you understand them, you might have your own set ways, but when you actually talk with real people and you hear their points of view, it forms your, you're constantly forming your opinion. So it's, as much as some of them might be off the wall, there's some sense to be made in everything that is said, and, or you just verify that, you know what, no, I'm absolutely right. So, um, but anyway, thank you for attending. Uh, it was a a pretty good uh, town meeting for the police department. Our budget got approved, so we're in good shape with that. What's very exciting um, is the fact that they approved for a one-year shot 
$120,000 for me to implement the proactive anti-crime unit. You might know that as the PAC unit. It's like the way police, it's a piece of policing that I believe has to happen. It is the most effective tool that we have implemented. We did a three month program last year and the results were staggering. It is really uh, something we're gonna make happen. So they approved me to do it for one year and trust me, we're gonna make it work. We're gonna make, and the results are gonna be, you're gonna have a better Yarmouth. It is gonna be safer. And along with that, and it flows right into our topic tonight, uh, uh, speaking of a lot of the drug issues, one of their uh, uh, primary goals will be to assist families who are struggling with drug addiction, to bring them to uh, the courthouse, to get uh, orders, to uh, do all types of things to show that we're just not coming to lock you up or spray you with Narcan. We are there to help because we have healthier people, we have a healthier community, we're all going to benefit from that. It flows right into Crime Watch. You know, the biggest fear in Crime Watch is house breaks. We do know there is a nexus with uh, drug abuse and misuse and alcohol with house breaks. So if we can help that problem a bit, it's going to help you all. Uh, we're very excited about it. It's a really a, uh, a concept that we weren't even thinking about uh, a little more than a year about a year ago, but uh, quite excited about that. Um, so we get that going. Uh, you probably heard recently we had the rash of armed robberies at the uh, gas stations. We solved the case as a result of working with our neighbors, working with the Dennis police, the Barnesville police. It worked. I mean, we, we got them. They were living in a motel in, uh, well, I shouldn't say living. They were staying at a motel in <laughs> South Yama. Uh, we've done a lot on getting away from people living in motels along the Route 28 strip, and it's been very effective. It's reducing crime. Our biggest patrol hazard that we had a year ago no longer exists. It is gone. We have a better West Yama. Uh, our street crime unit is is almost running out of targets. That's a good thing. But we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep putting the pressure on. When they know we're out there, they go away. We are creating a, uh, an environment that is not friendly to crime. And when they realize that people like you are out there as well, that you supplement what we do, it makes it better. So, um, I can take a few questions before we move on. Does anybody have any questions of me? Yes, sir. You mentioned the uh, student resource officer, John Ward, and it's SRO, right? Yes. Okay. So when I woke up yesterday, somebody said SRO to me, so I had no idea what they're talking about. And unfortunately today, this afternoon, at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the SRO is a hero, as I understand it, from the establishment. That's news to me. I'd never, I didn't even hear about that one today. I've been at My question is, there was an incident, 19 staff, uh, and the SRO person was there as a hero, but does that position share information and ways and files and everything nationally so that they gather from them and they gather from us? Absolutely, and I, just to know, uh, Nick Pascarosa, he is the one that developed the school lockdown program and has taught uh, police departments, school districts across New England and further. He did it. Amazing. They, they followed. Now, it's moved, it's, it's um, evolved into more than that. There are people who have added on to that, have all created things called ALICE training. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's really, uh, it goes further. It talks about defending, uh, teachers defending, and don't be harmless, don't be targets, run, do all types of things. But it's very complicated, too. As much as all the theories are good, they'll actually employ uh, teachers and train kids on how to do that. They're there to go to school, you know? But we, we do have a good level of uh, security. Uh, the school resource officers are a big part of making our schools safe. We have one at Dennis Yarmouth Regional. We actually have a Dennis officer who is there sometimes. We also have a full-time school resource officer at the Mattakees Middle School. And 
you know, that was something we, we incorporated a few years ago. It's uh, very effective. Um, if we ever decide to take him out of there, we, there would be a mutiny over there because it grows. There was some reluctance uh, over decades. It took a lot of time to get comfortable with having a police officer in the school and uniforms and guns. And, but now we're all part of the team and it, it all works. Um, and we've incorporated a lot of stuff. You might have heard about it and I do it myself is uh, after Sandy Hook, we uh, made the decision that we will be at the schools every opening and every closing every day. And we do that. With our, it didn't cost us a dime. We just auto, we enter the, all the schools in the computer and it automatically pops up. You go here, you go there. I personally, I go to St. Pius School every morning. And it is, uh, it's like getting a shot of adrenaline every morning when I go there. It is the best part of my day. Um, I, when you see the kids getting off the bus, when you see mom and dad dropping off their loved ones, when they come walking in and they're expecting them to go into this safe environment that, uh, you know, that uh, only has teachers that can only protect them with uh, books and pencils. Uh, and when we're there in uniform, uh, it's pretty powerful. And I get a bigger charge out of it than they probably do because I high five them every morning. Uh, just this morning, there's this one adorable little girl. She can't be more than five, maybe six. And she's the cutest little thing. She started giving me a hug about three weeks ago. And this morning, she, she comes, a little blonde girl, got a little, she's Russian. She's got a little chubby face and just dressed to the nines, coming in. And she gives me the big hug. She goes, can you tell me what your name is anyway? You know. <laughs> Uh, so, it was just adorable. I mean, and, and then, it, but it, but it shows you the innocence of, of kids, and you know, to have this horrible thing that happened in Sandy Hook, and for for what we still don't know why, but it also shows that we can be effective if we're doing our job right. That's my job to make sure these kids are safe. It is not just the school. It's you know, I need to be. We need to, our cops there doing our job, and we're doing it. So. I think we're doing about as well as anybody's doing it. Um, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Can someone uh, come up with a plan and, uh, to do horrendous things? Absolutely. But we're doing our best with what we got to make it safe. You know, even uh, just going to the equipment, we, we're ready. One of our officers in a fully packed police car that goes out there has seven weapons, seven different weapons in the car. They have a handgun, shotgun, rifle, beanbag gun, taser, OC spray, but baton, and a less lethal shotgun. They are ready for everything. We are first responders, and you know, and they are trained. We we developed the uh, active shooter training that uh, we we not only took it uh, from um, just Yarmouth. We work with the Cape Cod Regional uh, Law Enforcement Council, got our people trained, trained them how to respond to an incident, an active shooter training. Uh, and we did it, we, what, the reason why we did it regionally so that uh, when something like that happens, you need all your resources coming together and it only makes sense that we all have the same training. Because it's only in America can we do everything different in every community. Even, uh, even police, it's like amazing, it's so like, how can we pick a handgun in one town and say, this is the best gun available, but then you go next door over to Bonsville, they pick a completely different one and say, no, yours is terrible, this one's better. You know, and it's like, it goes across the board and we waste time and money and everything, but yet, so we took all our training and put it together. So from Falmouth to P-Town, from Bourne to Chatham, we're all trained the same. So we can work as a team, regardless of what community we go into. And we've continued that training. We just did uh, uh, at Yarmouth PD. We train all the uh, Cape Cod police officers come to Yarmouth PD through a 13-week uh, cycle and get retrained. We just retrain them all again in active shooter training. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot of moving parts in policing, and uh, and uh, so we we try to stay up on top of everything and do the best we can. Um, it's frustrating sometimes, particularly when I go to uh, like the Chiefs convention when they have these trade shows and you see these acres and acres of every police equipment you need 
but you have about 10 cents to, to buy stuff with. <laughs> it's, like, <clears throat> it's like, it's almost better off not going. But anyway, uh, I can assure you, you get your biggest bang with your buck for everything you do here. So, so enough, enough of my talking. Uh, we have some special guests here. And ironically, this is a, it's funny how life comes full circle in kind of funny ways. I grew up in the town of Randolph, which is just south of Boston. And we grew up in this old Irish, well, it was a new Irish neighborhood, but now it's an old Irish neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, lots of cousins. I mean, it's amazing. We were all grew up all about the same age. But, of course, then everybody goes their separate ways and does all the different things, and we end up in different places and different profiles and different experiences. But yet, tonight, our guest is my cousin, <laughs> who doesn't live down here, but has done amazing things. I was wondering why you gave her such a big hug. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, what she's been able to accomplish, and it's like when you don't see someone and know what their lives were, when you just totally lose contact. It's uh, amazing what this woman has gone through and what she's accomplished. And, and the hot bucket button topic of heroin overdose, she's the, head of, she's the tip of the spear right now. I don't know how you're doing it. Uh, it's like, my, oh, my God. But she's doing it because she's networking. She's getting people involved. She's got, a, got something that people believe in that's effective, that's working. She brought down to the Yarmouth PD every Tuesday night the Learn to Cope program. And it's, you know, I don't go to all of them. I've been to a couple and watch what's going on. But it's absolutely amazing to see the product that she is bringing or has helped to bring to families who struggle, that don't have skills, that have nowhere else to go, that have no support mechanism, that have the, the scourge of drug addiction infesting their family. But yet, you know, learn to cope. It's really a lot of hope that she is bringing to people, bringing them through and helping them. A little bit of tough love, putting them in the right direction. It's uh, quite impressive, and I'm quite proud to introduce Joanne Peterson. We have the same great grandparents. So, Thanks, there we go. <laughs> I'm proud of him, too. Well, I don't do anything. I have fun. Uh, Our parents are proud. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, what it is, her, uh, our um, great grandparents are the same. You and Norma McDonald who are immigrants from Ireland who arrived here. And so that's how we, uh, our bloodlines have flowed. And uh, in the police side, we have a long history, which I'm putting together. It's kind of interesting. Hugh McDonald's son, Patrick T. McDonald, an old Irish cop from Randolph. He was a motorcycle officer. He was drove an Indian. Drove an Indian, yeah. Uh, quite fast, $500 it cost in 1926. Uh, so, and it's carried through, through, through my father, through his son, uh, through my nephew, through now my son, who is a Barnstable police officer, through my cousin Thomas McDonald, who passed away a few years ago of cancer, who was a lieutenant in the Canton Police. So we have this other little cool little piece that I'm excited about that I'm putting together. But anyway, enough said from me. Joanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Um, before I get into really how Learn to Cope started and, and why it started, um, I just had a little conversation with my friends um, tonight about my grandfather, Pat, where he was the chief of police in Randolph, um, like Frank just talked about. And, you know, he drove the first Indian and the first motorcycle cop, and he arrested George the Pole. I'm sure you heard of that story. And, you know, but he was a really, really valiant man, and he was such a good man and he was like a father figure to me and um, years later when I went through what I'll tell you about what I went through I found out that he was very 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 passionate about helping people with addiction and that my grandmother used to get angry at him sometimes because 
he'd go out and help the drunkards. They'd call them the drunkards back in those days. And it wasn't unusual for, my mom told me one day, it wasn't unusual, you know, for my grandmother to be scolding my grandfather because the drunkard is in the garage and he's trying to sober him up and help him out. And, you know, so he cared also, like, about people as well as doing his job, too. Um, but he also cared about the families in the town. And, and um, you know, like Frank cares about the families in your community and, and um, you know, allowing us to bring a support network for those families that are really struggling. And I can tell you about some of the struggles that the family um, goes through and the guidance that they need to help motivate that young person into treatment so they're not out in the streets breaking into your homes or into your cars um, and trying to catch this before they go out and do these things, before they get heavily addicted to this drug. Um, so that we can get them, help the family get them into treatment and find affordable treatment um, so that they can get their life back before that happens and go on to college and get their degree and, you know, go on with their life because we do see that happen. I, I want to, before I begin, I want to say we do see a lot of people find, young people find long-term recovery and, and get their life back. Um, so quickly, um, back in late 2001, the year my son graduated from high school, um, I live in Raynham, that's not too, too far from here. Uh, he played football, basketball, baseball, but football was, was his game. That was his game. He had never been arrested, um, always did well in school. My husband and I would go to parent-teacher conferences. We did homework with him. We took family vacations in the summer, a lot of times down here. Um, took our boat down to Mashpee, Wakeby, which we still do today, water skiing. And, um, we were doing everything that every mother and father feels like they should do. Um, we, we took good care of my son and my other two kids. And I talked to him about drugs. I talked to him about alcohol. The drugs I talked to him about were marijuana. Back in those days, it was ecstasy. I talked about, you know, not drinking, not going to the underage drinking parties. I did everything I could to, to instill in him, please, you know, try not to make these decisions. Or if you're going to make these decisions, talk to me about it. I never, ever warned him about OxyContin. I never warned him about heroin because First of all, I had never heard of OxyContin, so I didn't even have the chance to warn him about that. Pill taking really wasn't a thing. We hadn't really heard a lot about pill taking back then. It was very, very new. And heroin, I didn't think anyone did that anymore. Honestly, even when I was growing up in Randolph in the 70s, the only people that did heroin, you know, were the people in the alleys and, you know, the dark, you know, you only saw that dark figure. It was just not something that we even dealt with. So I never thought to say, don't do heroin, don't do Oxycontin. Um, but my son did make a bad decision, and he paid some consequences that he deserved to pay for that. Consequences are a big thing in this. And my belief in what we teach at our meetings are People have to face consequences before they can have the will to want to get better. And sometimes we have to raise that bottom and let them face those consequences so that they will want to get better. Well, that's what ended up happening, and it took a long time. Um, my son started to change. I'll go through um, the strange things that I found in my house and the confusion. Um, but. It didn't take long for him to go from being a very responsible young man that loved to work, loved his neighbors, always looked good, always was clean cut, loved sports, loved his family, to someone that would duck me, didn't want to look at me. His friends completely changed. It, 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 you know, it was these strange people starting to call or come around. Money started missing from the house. He didn't want to work anymore. He was up all night not going to sleep and sleeping all day where I'd be like, what, what are you doing? Why aren't you going to work today? What's the, what's the matter? I thought he was depressed. He felt sick all the time. So I thought maybe he had some sort of something. I was taking him to specialists. I thought he had something wrong with his stomach. 
And he was going with me and saying, I know, I don't feel good, Mom. So, you know, we're getting all these tests done and upper GI and lower GI. He was going through withdrawal. But I didn't know what withdrawal looked like. When he was up all night and sleeping all day, I thought he was depressed because I do have a sister who, you know, suffers from, you know, depression and, and mental illness. So I thought, geez, maybe he's mentally ill. Maybe that's what it is. I brought him to a crisis center. And I, you know, and I asked him, are you depressed? And he was like, I am depressed, Mom. And he was depressed. But he wasn't saying, I'm doing drugs. So I brought him to a crisis center within 15 minutes. Now, he had turned 18. So first of all, back then, he wasn't still on our insurance because it ended at 18. He didn't have a job anymore. So everything I had to pay for out of pocket, which was very expensive, which I did, brought him to the crisis center. Within about 15 minutes, he came right back out. He didn't want me to go in with him because he was 18 now. And he had a prescription for lithium and sleeping pills. And the clinician said, I have good news and I have bad news. And I was like, OK. And he said, the good news is your son has bipolar. And he said, and the bad news is your son has bipolar. And I was like, OK. So then I thought, well, all right, at least I know what's wrong. And you know, people do have bipolar. It's a real condition. My son didn't. What my son was doing was heroin. And all of those symptoms look very, very similar to bipolar. The mood changes, the ups, the downs, the up all night, not being able to sleep, to sleeping all day. It's almost the exact same symptoms. But I didn't think to drug test him. The clinician didn't think to drug test him. But I started giving him lithium and sleeping pills. I could have killed my own son. I didn't know what he was doing. That's why I'm coming to this board. Now, this I don't use at our Learn to Cope groups. Um, I'll talk about this first before I talk about what Learn to Cope is and what it does. Um, but all of these things are things I would find in my house that were pieces to a puzzle that took me a long time to figure out. So I usually start with asking the audience, why do you think you would find Q-tips without the heads on them, just the sticks? Does anyone want to take a guess? How about the heads of the Q-tips without the sticks? You find those around all the time. Or a cigarette butt that's never been smoked and doesn't have a cigarette attached to it. I'd find those all the time on, you know, because I was starting to investigate. I'm like, something's wrong. These were starting to become non-existent in my house. <laughs> I either didn't have them anymore, or I'd find them and they'd be bent, so it looked like really hard ice cream, so they'd be really bent. So you know that I was finding, and I was at blaming actually my younger son, who at the time was about seven or eight, and I was asking him, are you digging in the sandbox with my spoons? Where are all my spoons going? I'd find these little orange caps. I didn't know what those belonged to. I'd find random bottle caps everywhere, but no bottles, just the caps. Never found the bottles. Then I started to find tin foil all crumbled up. And I started thinking, uh oh, something's really wrong when it had black stuff on it. And I'm Googling, I'm on the computer, I'm trying to figure all this out. Then you, you know, the pens. Another big clue without the ink so that someone can snort something. Another type of cap, and these are all real, by the way, the things I found. Another cap. What is this? I have no idea. And then this was it. This is his actual belt. I obviously cut it, but it's, there's teeth marks all over it. He was using that as a tourniquet, so I was really kind of scared at that point. And then it finally all occurred to me, pills can be melted here, turned into liquid, poured into the spoon, or heroin can be mixed with a substance in the bottle cap, poured into, into the bottle cap. 
Q-tip heads go into the spoon. The substance is in the spoon here. And then the worst thing I've ever found in my life, that needle goes into the Q-tips, filters out the heroin or the pills. Back then it was the 80 milligram Oxycontins, which since then have changed. Um, the manufacturer of those Oxycontins, they did change them. The FDA asked them to change them a couple of years ago after many, many fights going to the FDA. <laughs> All sorts of things because so many kids and even legitimate patients were becoming addicted to this. We have a mom, her son had cancer. He was legitimately on that Oxycontin, went into remission and is still a heroin addict today because when they took him off of it, he couldn't, he had to keep going. They changed the, sub, the, the formulation of it so that when an 80 milligram Oxycontin was crushed, it used to have a time release on it. They would have to wipe that time release off and then crush it up. And when you crushed up an 80 milligram Oxycontin and snorted it, you may as well take 16 Percocets and down them with some water. That's how much opiate went straight into your bloodstream or straight through your nostrils, nostrils and straight to your receptors. So the very next day, you're sick because you got so much, you know, you got so much opiates in your system at such a short amount of time that you got that heroin high. It was basically pure heroin in a pill once it, the time release was taken off and it was crushed up. Was OxyContin a miracle drug for cancer? Absolutely. But unfortunately, the way it got marketed out there is it was marketed as safe for moderate pain when it should have only been for very chronic pain, cancer, really, really chronic conditions, and that didn't happen. Dentists were giving it out. People were getting it for teeth work, for sprained ankles, and even the doctors didn't know. They thought it was safe for moderate pain, so it caused this massive thing. So in 2001, my son graduates high school. Starts going out, it's summertime, he's with his football buddies. Five of them go to a house where there's an underage drinking party and the father's buying the alcohol for all the kids and inviting them all over, which is common. You hear about it. Thank God for these new social host laws. Doesn't always, not everyone pays attention. Unfortunately, this one particular guy didn't either. And not only did he supply them alcohol, he had crushed up Oxycontin on a mirror and he handed it to his own son, my son, and four other boys. <laughs> and um, my son, who wanted to be a state police officer, I mean, you heard about our family with the law enforcement, that was my ultimate dream. I thought I was going to see him in those black, shiny boots and that blue uniform. I mean, he had just graduated. It was the happiest time of my life. And I thought, it's going to be wonderful. He's going to go to the police academy. He's going to do this. Well, guess what? He went to this house, and he made the worst decision that changed his life and our entire family's life for years. Um, do kids that age do that? Yeah. Does it matter if you're an attorney, a doctor, a police officer, a lawyer, a superintendent of schools, a nurse? If you're a married parents, single parents, gay parents, it doesn't matter how well somebody has parented their kids. And I'm not saying this to scare the heck out of everybody, but does anyone know why someone can't rent a car until they're 25? The scientific reason behind that? Because an adolescent brain exactly, is not developed until somebody is 25 years old. So like Dr. John Kelly from Mass General Hospital who comes and presents and educates us at our meetings to help us understand what our family members go through, he explains it just that way. That adolescents make bad decisions sometimes, no matter who they are. And there's different reasons why. They're either doing it because everybody else is, or they're doing it because they, they have that little risk. You know, they like to take risks, like the ones that want to try snowboarding like that without a lesson or jump off a cliff into a quarry. And, you know, they do dumb things sometimes. 
So I think my best advice for people out there that have grandchildren or children is to get yourself educated. What are opiates? There's a whole array of opiates out there. But a lot of us don't know what an opiate is. Is there anyone that can name five different opiate prescription pills that might be prescribed? There's Vicodin, which is very, very powerful, very probably the most widely prescribed opiate that there is. Very useful if you have really, you know, bad dental work done or um, sprains. The problem is a lot of times people go home with that prescription that don't e they don't even know what it is and they might have 30 or 60 of them that they go home with and they might only need it for three days. Then the pill bottle goes into a cabinet or like we've seen happen, they go back to college. Um, the other kids find out, oh, you have Vikes? I'll take one of those or, you know, you can get 20 bucks each for those or you can get 50. You know, the kids don't always think like an adult even when they're in college. There's also a new one, well, not really new anymore, but you might have heard of it, Perk 30. Anyone heard of Perk 30s? <clears throat> Perk 30s are not Percocet. The only reason they're called Perk 30s is they're blue, and they're 30 milligram oxycodone rapid release pills. Now, regular Perks are oxycodone with Tylenol. These PERC 30s that they call on the street PERC 30 are oxycodone with no Tylenol and no time release. So those really got out there when they changed the formulation of the Oxy 80s that I told you about that when they're crushed now they turn to gel. So another pharmaceutical company put out the, the new in Oxy 30s, which are just a little bit cheaper than the 80s. You, you need two of them instead of one. So it just basically replaced those. So another one of our fights out there is make every opiate drug tamper-proof. <laughs> Not just one, all of them. There's morphine patches. I'm sure you've heard about fentanyl. The fentanyl patches, somehow they get out there in droves. And those are for terminally ill people. They're patches. They're, they are so potent. I don't know how so much of it gets out there, but it does. Morphine, you can take morphine home now. You can take methadone home in a pill now for pain. Um, so my best advice to people, even just my friends at a cookout will say to me, what should I do? You know, what should I, I'm like, get yourself educated. Find out what opiates are. If, you, if your daughter falls down in cheerleading and you go to the emergency room, ask questions. The doctors are really busy. So they don't always have time to explain to you that, this can be highly addictive. If they're on anxiety medicines, you might not want to give this to them because they can overdose. Um, you know, things like clonopin or Ativan, all those benzodiazepines that a lot of people are on for anxiety. If you mix that with an opiate, you're at high risk for an overdose. We have had senior citizens overdose by accident, real cases where they are legitimately on pills that they legitimately need, but they live alone sometimes. They might have forgotten that they already took a pill, and they go and they take another one. They might be on a benzo for anxiety or depression, and now they're, they're overdosing by accident. So best case scenario is we live in, a, they call this Generation Rx, there's a lot of pills out there now. There's a lot of treatment for a lot of different conditions, a lot of pain. So the best case scenario is ask questions. When you see the doctor, if you have kids in sports, grandkids, talk to your grandkids, ask questions. Um, back in 2001, I didn't know anything about these pills. If I had warned my son about OxyContin, would that have stopped him? I don't know. What would I have done differently? I have no idea. It just happened to us. Um, took us a couple of years before we learned what we needed to do to help him get better. He's got long-term recovery today, married with two children. He's, he's now 31. This happened when he was just turning 19. He's gone on with his life. He's put together more time 
you know, clean and sober than he ever did using. He's got a little over eight years. He had a little bit of a blip in between when he turned 25 because he got clean pretty young. And then, you know, the Patriots are on on Sundays and the beer commercials and everyone else's age can have a beer in the backyard when they're cooking on their grill. How come I can't? And started getting too busy for meetings and, you know, he worked hard, had the condo and he's like, maybe I can have a beer now and then. You know, that was never my problem, which honestly it really wasn't. But as soon as somebody becomes addicted to these pills and they have done that kind of damage to their brain, putting another substance like that in their body can put them at high risk for going right back to where they were before. And that's what happened. It didn't take that long. But luckily, uh, we knew what to do. He knew what he needed to do, and it was quick. And he went back to treatment. We put him back <laughs> into treatment. There was no, no stopping at go, no collecting 200, you're going. You know, because I've seen way too many deaths. Part of, part of what I do is going to a lot of funerals, sadly. Um, I have a lot of friends. You know, we have, um, you know, my son got clean and sober. He's long-term recovery now. What I started back in, you know, Randolph at Randolph High School, because I was a mom that needed help. I had nowhere to go. I didn't know what OxyContin was. I didn't know heroin was snortable and it was 90% pure. I thought you had to have a needle to use it. Um, and after about two years of trying to learn all this on my own and how to find a detox and that the first detox is probably the first of many years of detoxes actually, um, trying to afford it, it's not unusual for it to cost thirty to forty thousand dollars a month to put your son or daughter in treatment. I'm not joking. Even if you have insurance, the insurance company's like, nope, he's had enough. No more. You're on your own. They would much rather see you pay for that. They want the state to pay for it. Yet the insurance companies take our money out of our paychecks, hard working paychecks every week. We go to use it and they're like, no, he's been to treatment already. You'll have to call back next year. That's when you go and you second mortgage your house, you sell your boat. You, you know, luckily, some people have the money. What about the ones that don't? They just watch their kids die right in front of their eyes. And I can tell you, as being someone that has been through this, I wouldn't wish this on any parent or grandparent. We have so many grandparents that end up taking custody of their grandchildren. It's very sad. I know you heard the stories about this epidemic is people are becoming pregnant and, you know, they're already addicted. So there are so many legs to this. Um, so my best advice for people that aren't in this is just get educated about it, even if you don't have kids, but you have friends that have kids or neighbors that have kids. Learn about it. We all need to learn about it because if we ever get sick, what do we want to be put on for medication? I know, I, I know what I won't be on. That's just my personal choice. Um, so learn to cope. As I said, it started back in 2004 when I needed somewhere to go. And um, back then, district attorney well, it was District Attorney Keating back then. He's now Congress Congressman Keating. I worked for the National Fire Protection Association, and I was really, really struggling um, because I would go to work and put on that face that everything's okay. Meanwhile, my heart was ripped out because I didn't know where my son was. He was missing, or he was turning blue on the couch the other day, and I didn't know if he was going to make it, or I was afraid I'd get that phone call that day. Is he going to die today? or I was back in the, I need a bed, I need a bed, and taking those four days worth of phone calls to get a bed because either one I couldn't afford anymore because I had already burnt up on my bank account and sold enough of my assets. Um, he didn't have insurance because back then, you know, he wasn't covered. And then, or I'd go to the courthouse and I'd beg a judge to put him in Bridgewater to save his life because I knew if I didn't do that, I was going to either put him there and ask the judge and, and take all my pride away and
stand in front of a judge and say, my son's a, a drug addict and he's going to die, or I was going to buy a coffin and pick out something for him to wear in it. I chose the judge. So yes, I used the Section 35 process. I did it more than once, and I was very grateful to have that. I didn't care where he went at that point, as long as it wasn't six feet underground. And I didn't want to be standing at his grave someday and saying, why didn't I try that? And that's what gave me the courage to do it. And he was a young boy. He was a boy, a baby. My little, he was supposed to be a state police officer. So, you know, parents grieve. They're not, whether somebody lives or dies, it, when this happens to their son or daughter, they're grieving, and they're grieving hard because they're grieving the loss of who that person was going to be. That takes a long time to swallow. I used to say I would rather swallow a handful of glass. I want my old son back. I want my life back. But I had to realize that it was never going to be that. Uh, it was never going to be. And then trying to take care of your marriage. You've got to take care of your marriage and your other kids. You know, you go to their sporting events. I was there physically, but mentally I was gone. Again. Where am I going to find treatment? How am I going to afford treatment? My, his whole focus in life now was, where's my next fix? Where's my next fix? What can I steal next to get my next fix? He stole every valuable thing that we had. And um, we were living like prisoners. And his, that was his daily job, was to find his next fix. My daily job was to keep him alive and try to find him a bed that he could stay in for more than four days. Because after four days, he was out and back home again. And then I, had no, I was right back to square one. And that went on and on and on and on and on. Until one day, I was at work at NFPA. And a coworker, I had told a few people, not many, because, again, not an easy thing to say. Oh, guess what? Oh, your son's starting college in September? Oh, well, mine's a drug addict. How do you do that? You don't. You just go into a little shell and you don't want to talk to anybody or you just want to crawl under a rock. Um, so I did tell a few people and they were very good to me. And um, one of them was my boss. He was wonderful. And one day I'm sitting at my desk and it was another one of those horrible days. And all of a sudden this piece of paper comes over my shoulder and lands in front of me. And I look at it and it says, there's a stranger in town, OxyContin. And then it said, District Attorney Bill Keating of Norfolk County is holding a forum in Stoughton, at the Stoughton High School, to warn the public about this new drug that all these kids are getting addicted to. And I was just like, oh my god, someone's actually talking about this. So I picked up the phone and I called Keating's office. And um, his secretary answered and I said, I'm one of these families. This, I've been go I had already been going through with this a couple of years, like two years. and. Um, my son was in jail. He finally ended up in jail. He did something that he deserved to go to jail for. <laughs> I was never one that thought, oh no, he shouldn't, you know, I needed him to face consequences. He needed to face consequences. He deserved to be there. Did that mean that my heart wasn't broken? No. So I called Keating's office and I talked to the secretary for a few minutes and then we hung up and I said, yeah, I think I might want to come. And um, I just wanted to hear what, what was going on. Because I had wished that someone had warned me about it before. Not that it could have changed anything, but it might have. Um, so about five minutes went by and the phone rings and it's Bill Keating. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> and um, he's like, listen, I was wondering if you'd come and talk about what you're going through. And I'm like, oh, geez, I don't know if I could ever do that. And he said, well, your son's in jail, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, wouldn't this help him? Because I told him, you know, my son had done something really stupid, <laughs> really stupid. And it was obviously drug-related, like most of these things are. And, um, but every, when it got in the newspaper, everyone knew what he did. They didn't know that he was this clone of, of what he used to be, that my son was gone. It was just this little creature running around that, you know, I was trying so hard to save and pull in, and I couldn't. And then he did this stupid thing. But everyone knew what he did. But no one knew the story behind the story. 
So my younger kids got bullied incessantly in school because all of a sudden he was the junkie in town. I walked into like a country store and ran into one of the parents that I used to buy coffees for. We used to take turns buying coffees for each other. She just couldn't even talk to me. She didn't even know what to say. She just walked out of the store. And uh, then it was like, okay, so this is going to be my fault. <laughs> this is, you know, what kind of bad parents are we? So not only was that happening, my kids were getting it. Um, my daughter especially, it was her freshman year in high school when all this happened, so it didn't start out for a good high school. That whole four years really was horrible for her. Um, so he said to me, he goes, well, if he's already in jail, maybe you ought to talk to him about it and see how he feels. And I was like, you know, you have a good point. Because I had told him about it and it had been in the paper. So I went and I visited my son. And I said, uh, what do you think? You know, and he's like, I think you should talk about it, Mom. Because by then, he is, he was, the drugs were all out of his system. He was feeling remorse. He was himself again. And you looked like Eddie Haskell, for God's sakes, from, you know, I mean, he was like Eddie <laughs> growing up. So um, I said, so do you want to, what do you want to do? I mean, if I get up there and say that you're in jail, you know, do you want me to talk about everything? And he said, yeah. And that's when he kind of told me about that parent. That's when I found out that in my mind, he was pretty much a victim first. This guy was an adult. My son, he was, him and his they were 18 years old. He may as well have taken out a gun, lined them all up, and gone boom, 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 and shot them all in the knees because he handicapped them. Even today, my son, he does really well, but he has to really maintain sobriety. It's hard work being sober. So he said, do you want to, you know, do you want me to talk about that? And he said, yeah, because I think he was starting to realize what happened to all of them. The next year, one of his friends that ended up dying, I still think that man's responsible for that boy's death. So he said, yeah, Ma, go ahead. He said, I owe that to the family. He knew what we were all going through with the newspaper articles. I mean, he didn't do anything hugely horrible, but I mean, it, it, was, it embarrassed us. It hurt all of us, our whole family. So he said, go ahead and do it. So then I get up on, on the stage, and I just stood there and cried like an idiot. But, um, and I said to the crowd, I said, I just want my son back. And I talked about all the weird things I found in my house. And um, all of a sudden, I'm looking around as I'm talking, and I see mothers crying and going like this. And I'm like, oh, I'm not the only one in this room that's going through this. Um, I just could tell, you know, by the way they were looking at me and um, that eye contact. And there was a reporter there that night, and he said, can I write about this? And I said, as long as at the end you put in, at the end of your article, put my email address in, which was Learn to Cope 2001, because I'd be hiding in my office under that name, trying to research things. I didn't want anyone to know who I was. <laughs> I was Learn to Cope. So um, he published the article about that evening and I got like 90 emails in about 24 hours after that article went out and it was like whoa I heard from people from all over the South Shore of Massachusetts and the next thing you know I'm trying to answer all these emails and it was just my daughter my granddaughter my son this one passed away that one passed away this Oxycontin what it's crazy it's everywhere you know so I eventually just found a room first meeting there was like 30 people and the story goes on so today, as I said, my son, thank God, is in long-term recovery. My family's in recovery. And what we do now is we help other people. So Learn to Cope started in 2004 as one group. Today, there's 12 around the state. Um, the most recent groups are Yarmouth, New Bedford, Cambridge, and Holyoke. Um, we've got groups on the North Shore. We've got groups in Worcester. Um, we also have a website that grows every single day. Um, the last count was 5,160 something. I'm sure by tomorrow it's going to be 5,180 something because we were on the Today Show this morning and they put our <laughs> information up. So, you know, it's actually starting to, 
There's other states that want support like this. Um, what is the difference between Learn to Cope and Al-Anon? Al-Anon is fantastic. Al-Anon is great. If I went to Al-Anon tonight, I would be happy and I would get what I need for me. But what I wanted for Learn to Cope is I wanted support, education, resources, and hope. And the education piece is we invite guest speakers that work in treatment. We invite people in recovery. Those are our favorite speakers because we learn so much from them. Um, and then resources. And then hope. And there's, there's nothing better than when you walk into a meeting and you are so distraught because you just found these awful things in your house or well, that needle and somebody says, I know how you feel. There's nothing better than that. And then to walk out later, an hour and a half later, with a bunch of resources, you know, tips about treatment, what does treatment look like, where is treatment, you know, also, and then see, hearing people say, my son was where your son is, now he's got four years recovery. And, and all of this, like crosstalk, asking people questions, that's all what I wanted. So I, I designed it to be everything I really needed. And um, so it is different, and um, it is what it is. I mean, these people, when, when your loved one comes down with a, any other kind of condition, I say disease because I, I believe addiction, you may not be born with addiction as a baby, but you can certainly develop it. <laughs> and um, it's not like any other, you know, diabetes. My husband has diabetes. If he does not eat properly, if he does not monitor his insulin levels and use his insulin twice a day, if he does not exercise, he's not going to be healthy. If he starts drinking a bunch of Coca-Cola and eating a bunch of cookies and, and not maintaining his disease, he's going to get really sick. It's the same thing for recovery. If somebody is not working really hard and taking care of their body the way they need to and, and the opposite, not putting substances that they shouldn't be in their body, then they're going to get sick. When my husband came down with diabetes, it wasn't much different than what happened to my son. I was scared and I wanted information. Guess what? I got it like that. Here's how you know the difference between hypo and hyperglycemia. This is when you need to give him insulin. This is when you need to give him candy or orange juice. Watch out for these signs and symptoms. I had to teach my kids how to give insulin in case he ever went into diabetic shock. You go to pick up your 18-year-old at treatment, can't talk to you, there's HIPAA laws. Well, what can I do? Is there anywhere? Call the substance abuse helpline. That's it. No, oh, he could overdose. Relapse is very, very common in the early recovery. If there's a relapse, watch these symptoms or, or even something like long-term treatment would be a really good idea. Here are a few options. <laughs> there was none of that, none of it. So that's what we do here. Our groups are really, it's not me that runs these groups. I just happened to start it, and yes, I'm really involved in it, but now, today, there are over 90 facilitators, and they're all parents of people in recovery. Um, we've got now close to 50 of them are trained and certified by the Department of Public Health to give out Narcan, which I know you've heard a lot about here because, you know, you offer it here on the Cape. But this is Narcan, reverses an overdose within one to three minutes. Learn to Cope is certified by the Department of Public Health um, to give it out at every single chapter, every single week. Um, 23 parents have saved their own kids' lives since December of 2011 with this. They're alive. And the difference between you know, there's a, this controversy. I'm going to be in Atlanta this month, and I'm going to be up against somebody that's going to tell the audience that this might not be safe for a family to have in the house. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I've been Narcan by accident, and I'm alive. 
Um, the only adverse effect this could have is if somebody in the room is legitimately on opiates for a legitimate reason and they are legitimately in pain and if this gets sprayed near them, it's going to take the opiate off their receptor. Um, but this stuff, when it's, we teach people signs and symptoms of overdose. And if they see those symptoms, the first thing we tell them is 911 right away. And then we teach them how to rescue breathe, how to assess it. If, if the best way to find out if someone's overdosing is if, if you take your knuckle and you do the sternum rub and they don't respond, 911. If they're an opiate user and that happens, it's pretty much a guarantee that they're overdosing. So one mom, the mom actually that was on the Today Show this morning and talked so bravely about her son, um, had just come to our meeting and just gotten this that same week. And one night, they were in the midst, they knew their son had relapsed, they were in that gap where they're looking for treatment, there's no beds available, this and that, and they hear a thud upstairs. She grabs the Narcan off the um, refrigerator where she kept it, ran up, saved his life. And he's in long-term recovery today. He has a job every day. These people, there's people out there that will say, let them all die, they're all scum. That's so hard to read. <laughs> Whenever there's an article, there's always somebody that's hiding behind a computer that says they're all a bunch of scumbags. You know what? They're people's children. Even if they're 25 or 30 or 40, that's still somebody's son or daughter. Does it matter? So we give this out. And um, I guess that's about it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to to answer questions. Have I horrified you all? <laughs> Everyone's like, <laughs> okay, I had you first and then I'll go with you. You know, we've been asking that question for a really long time, and we get a lot of different answers. And um, there is one thing, one glimmer of hope here, and that's the prescription pill monitoring program, which isn't perfect yet, and it's not mandatory yet. Hopefully it will be. But um, the amount of pills that are given are, are just insane. Um, and a lot of times people will say, I, I don't think I need those, and they'll still go home with 30 or 60 pills. That, I think, is going to change eventually. Um, but I wish I had a solid answer for that. I think there's many different answers. I mean, you did have a doctor down here a few years ago in Sandwich that was the top prescriber for OxyContin, and he had 2,000 patients, and he, he gave out one-third of all OxyContin prescriptions in the entire state. People were coming here from Worcester. And by the way, our parents' group, that was us protesting out in front of his office when he got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> because that happened to be the doctor that was giving the pills to the guy that ruined my son's life. There are people who say um, that it's not been, that it just kind of prolonged people on their addiction and all that, but I don't buy that either. I mean, if someone is dying from the floor, you've got to do it. Right. If there are people who always couldn't do it because, you know, they're just going to go back to where they are. Mm -hmm. Well, I could speak for families for sure. I mean, if you, if you have a son or daughter or husband or wife that's allergic to bees, would you not get the EpiPen because they, you know, and say, well, if, if they're going to get stung by a bee again. And yeah, they, you know, it's tough to understand addiction sometimes if it hasn't happened to someone you love, but relapse happens and it happens frequently, especially in early recovery. So why not have something to save somebody's life so that they can be alive to make the choice eventually, hopefully, to go to treatment. You know, Chris Herron, um, I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah. He's alive. He was Narcan. Look what he's doing today. Look at all the people and young people he's helping today. So I'm glad someone narcan him.
where it didn't need to happen, or just take someone down from you who they like the most, because they're just standing there because they're mad at you. Right. What would their review be? Exactly. You know? I mean, what, what would you do? If I saw somebody in any type of distress, whether I had Narcan or not, I'd run over and try to help them. I think most people would. Did you have one? Did you have one? No. You know why? Because by the time I got the whole story, it was way too late. It, was, it would have been my word against him. I did go to the police, and they couldn't. Real, there was really nothing they could do. They understood, obviously. In fact, one of the officers was my son's old football coach, so he was really upset too. They, people in town were. I mean, they loved my son too. Um, but there was really. First of all, he he was prescribed it. Not it wasn't legitimately, obviously. The, there was nothing wrong with the guy. Um, so everybody's hands were tied, inclu including the police. And finally, he moved away, and I'm glad. Uh, now that I know so much about addiction, like you, back then, I still didn't quite understand it. I had to finally also try to forgive in my heart. Although I don't know if I could ever fully look at him and you know hug him or anything, or <laughs> by any means. But I had to understand that there was probably a time that he was a normal husband and father. And the same thing probably happened to him, you know, with becoming a, an addict that would make him and cause him to do a lot of the things that my son ended up doing, you know. So I had to really come to grips with that and just let it go. Um, do I wish that we could have had him prosecuted? Absolutely. I hope today he's not doing that anymore um, but yeah it was it was rough when I found out I, I really it was hard to come to terms with that an adult that was my age would do that to his own son too not just mine that was tough yeah As long as we do, I mean, our meetings are for people who love someone who's suffering from addiction. Um, but many times we'll get like a phone call from someone that's a student, you know, studying to work in addictions. And for us, we feel like we'd like them to come because, you know, we want them to see that side of it. Um, so as long as it's somebody that's concerned, you know, not media, of course, we wouldn't want that. but. As long as it's someone that has grandchildren or children or, and is concerned and wants to learn, we're, we're normally not going to tell you you have to leave. If you are a reporter, yeah, we <laughs> tell you you've got to go. <laughs> but, yeah. This would be oh. a question on the, the new drug, Zohydro. <laughs> Zohydro, yes. Um, we have been fighting um, about Zohydro for months. As um, soon as we heard about it, we knew it was going to be a big deal. Um, 10 times stronger than Vicodin. And the thing that really blows my mind and so many others is heroin and prescription opiate addiction has gone up 400% in this country. In Massachusetts, overdose is the number one cause of death. So why is the FDA approving this? And another thing that will blow your mind is the FDA has a panel. Now, I've been to the FDA several times with other parents from all over the country. A lot of those parents, their kids are dead. And you get that 30 seconds, and you get the red light, and you say what you're going to say. The red light goes out. The microphone goes off, and it's next. You get the lobbyists all running around in their Italian suits and wondering how much money this one's going to make, how much money that one's going to make. It's actually really horrifying to go to that. And then Zohydro. 11 people on the FDA panel said, no, don't approve it. Two people on the panel said, let it go by, and they approved it. What is wrong? How does that happen? I don't understand that. Does anyone else understand Big that? Business. Big business. business. It's business. Well, Governor Patrick made the decision the other day to not allow it here. 
which was really a smart thing for him to do. You know, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, that was a really smart thing to do because he has seen what ha the emergency room visits in Massachusetts, the cost to all of you and to me, I'm a taxpayer, for treatment has gone through the roof. Um, it affects so many, it affects everybody, no matter whether they have someone that they love that's an addict or not, it's affecting you because it's affecting you in the pocket, it's affecting the police officers, the schools, the crime rates are sky high. These break-ins, those break-ins, like, like, you know, the chief said, that's drug, definitely drug-related. Why else would you, you know, you're going to sell things to make money for more drugs? These pawn shops, I'd like to see all pawn shops gone. I hate pawn shops. You know how many of my things ended up in those pawn shops? <laughs> and they know they're buying stolen goods. You know, when you come walking in there with an engagement ring three times a week, something's wrong. You know, Nana's not giving it to you to go bring to the pawn shop. So there's so many things that need to be fixed that we the people can do it. That's why, you know, I, what I love about Learn to Cope, a lot of them, we had the whole fed up rally, we go to Washington and we fight, 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 fight for that kind of change. We have with the ONDCP, which is the Office for the National Drug Control Policy, um, which reports directly to the White House. And Michael Botticelli, who used to be the commissioner here in Massachusetts for the, um, the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, is now heading that up, which is really good because he's so well educated on it. So I think that's a, a, probably my guess is that's where Governor Patrick knew enough that this was a big deal, don't let this go through in Massachusetts. Of the two people who approved it, was one of them the chairman or not the chairman? I'm not sure who the two people were that approved it. That's a good question. I could fi find out. There was, there was something in the news recently. There was a vote where the chairman had voted not to approve and it ultimately got it to, but I'm not sure if it was that issue. I don't know. All I know is that there were 11 people said no, two said yes, and it went through, because it's a huge conf controversy around the country. People are in an uproar over it. And now I'm hearing that the company that's making it is trying to sue the governor and get it through. And, you know, Zogenics uh, Zogenix or something like that, they make it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, manu they're, they're making the drug and they want it to, to be available um, and they're fighting for it now. And I just think right now is a very bad timing. There's too many people out there. Um, and, you know, I think getting educated, I, I was at Sharon High School last night and there was a lot of um, teachers, adjustment counselors, um, school administrators, parents. A lot of these funny things are found in high school bathrooms sometimes. So I think things like this, you know, can really help because a home drug test kit tells a big story. These, we have these at our meetings too and they're 12 panel kits. And um, if a parent calls my office and says, I'm not really sure, you know, what they're doing, I tell them, get one of these. We, we actually have these at our meetings. And um, <coughs> Yeah, they're not going to be happy when you tell them to pee in a, a cup. But um, the Dr. Falzoni last night was at Sharon High School, and I was so proud of him because he has a young teenage girl. He has already done this to her, and he doesn't, he's not even suspecting yet, but he wants her to know that he can. So, you know, I, I agree with that. I think if you're under 18, you, you don't have all that much privacy. And if, you, if a parent says, you know, I'm here because I, I want to protect you and, you know, I'm a little suspicious, so I want to make sure you're not doing anything that would harm you. So it's controversial. I'm all for it because the younger you can find out what's in their system, the better the chances are that they're not going to be out running around breaking into your cars and end up in jail when they 
probably a lot of them have a brilliant mind and, and could be, I really think in my heart of hearts that if my son was not at that house that night, he would be a state police officer today. I don't think he would have gone down that road. I really don't. And that's my opinion, but my heart tells me that. So if you can just arm yourselves or tell people to arm, arm yourself, sports are not a vaccine. My son played them all. He was a good student. He got okay grades. He wasn't an honor roll student, but you know, a lot of the kids, the parents that come to our groups, their kids were honor roll students or they were in college. We have kids that have started this in college, made it through high school, go off to college and start taking these things, not realizing what they are. Or they start with Adderall, which is for ADD that, you know, keeps you awake so that you can do your studies and the next thing you know you're starting to get addicted to that and then there's other pills around and you know it does it's not always high school kids some of them have to get plucked out of college to go to detox and start that whole treatment process but again a lot of them find long-term recovery there are many people in long-term recovery in fact Alcoholics Anonymous is the biggest organization in the world. There's a good reason for that because it works. And um, there's all sorts of treatment methods. So being a parent of somebody that suffers, it's really overwhelming because you've got so much information that you just have to learn in a very short <coughs> amount of time. And, you, and one of them is how to save their life now because so many are overdosing. It's really been terrible. This is the worst I've ever seen. And I've been doing this for 10 years now. We're on our 10th year. This is the worst past few months I have ever seen, and I hate even saying that. Thank you very much for having me.